In this video, we're going to go over rate laws. Rate laws are equations that relate the reaction rate to the concentration of the reactants. Essentially, it tells us how the rate of a reaction depends on the concentration of the reactants. The form of the rate law is always the same. You always have K times the concentration of reactants to some exponent. Now here, the lowercase k, this is called the rate constant. We'll discuss this to more detail in a later video. X is the reaction order. So again, this gives us more detail as to how the rate of the reaction depends on the reactant concentration. And the reaction order will be different numbers. It could be zero, it could be one, it could be two. And that would tell you, hey, if you doubled the reacting concentrations, how will the reaction rate respond? Will it not change? Will it double? Will it, will it quadruple? That's what the reaction order will tell us. Now, for LAMCAT, you will be expected to be able to determine the rate law using two different approaches. One approach is using experimental data, and the other is using elementary steps. We'll start with experimental data. The situation is usually, they'll give you some sort of reaction, and here we're going with a pretty generic reaction. A plus B plus C gives us D plus E. What they will do is, they will run the reaction through several trials. You can see here we have four trials, and in these four trials, they're going to vary the concentration of the reactants, A, B, and C, while measuring the reaction rate. You can see here, this last column is the change in concentration of D over T. Since D is a product, this is essentially measuring the rate of product production, which is a measure of reaction rate. So how can you use this information to determine the rate law? Well, there's a number of steps that you can follow to get the correct answer. So the first step is start with the generic equation. So that means here, we're always gonna start with rate, and it's gonna be rate is equal to the rate constant, K times the concentration of our reactants, A, B, and C. And now, what we need to figure out are the exponents. Let's call it X, Y, and Z. We want to know what is X equal to, what is Y equal to, and what is Z equal to to determine the rate law for this reaction. Now, the next step is you want to take a look at your rate data. And the strategy here is to figure out these exponents, X, Y, and Z, one at a time. And the way you can do that is by picking two trials where the concentration of all the reactants stay the same except one. That way, when you look at how the reaction rate differs, you can say that the reaction rate changed because of the change in concentration in that particular reactant. So as I said, pick trials where the concentration of only one reactant changes. So for instance, let's say we want to start off by looking at what is the rate order for A, right? I want to figure out what X is for A. So I need to look for two trials where the concentration of A changes, but the concentration of B and C do not change. So I can't pick trials one and two because the concentration of A did not change. If I look at trials two and three, I can see that the concentration of A was doubled from 0.1 to 0.2, and the concentrations of B and C were not changed. They're both 0.1 and 0.1. So that means here, I can go ahead and take a look at trials two and three. And in trials two and three, since the concentrations of B and C are constant, they are not changed, then I can leave them out for now. So I can really just say that the change in my reaction rate 
is dependent solely on A. And when I change the concentration of A, I can ask, how did the reaction rate change? So specifically, from trial two to three, I doubled the concentration of A. Let's plug that in. K times two. When I doubled the concentration of A, my reaction rate also doubled. So let's plug that in. So now the question we have to answer is, okay, I doubled the reactant concentration and that doubled my reaction rate. What exponent could I fill in for X that will give me this value? In other words, two to what power will give me two? And that answer is one, so that tells us our reaction is first order with respect to A. The reaction order is one. We can now continue, let's take a look at B. B, again, we need to pick two trials where the concentration of B changes, but the concentrations of A and C stay the same. So if we look at trials one and two, we can see that the concentration of B changed, and the concentrations of A and C did not change. So those are two good trials for B. So we'll look at trials one and two. And here, since only B is changing, we can exclude A and C from our rate law. So it's just K times B to the power of Y. So now, again, we look at from trials one to two, or if you want to go from trial two to one, both of them are the same thing. I'd probably recommend going from trial two to one because then you're doubling the reaction concentration, which is easier to think of than dividing the reaction concentration by two. So here, if we double the concentration of B, our reaction rate actually does not change. So because it doesn't change, that means it changed by a factor of one, which it didn't change. So now we have to ask ourselves, two to what power gives us one? And that answer is zero, because anything to the power of zero is one, which means our reaction is zeroth order with respect to B. All right, so finally we have to take a look at C. So C, again, we're looking for two trials where the concentration of C changes, but nothing else change. If we just scan the column for C, we can see that trial four is the only one where the concentration of C changes. So we're definitely gonna use trial four. If we look at trial one and trial four, well, that won't work because C is changing and A is changing, and also B is changing, so they're all changing. So how about trials two and four? Well, that also won't work because C is changing and A is changing. So finally, we can check three and four. From three to four, A doesn't change, B doesn't change, but C does. So that means we want to use trials three and four. And now we can isolate just C. So we have K times C to the power of Z. So now, if we go from trial three to four, we're doubling the concentration of C. So here, we can go ahead and plug in for C. This is gonna be equal to two. And we can look at what happens to our reaction rate from trial three to four. From trial three to four, we go from four to 1.6, which looks like it's reduced, but you have to be careful with your numbers. This is four times 10 to the negative three. This is 1.6 times 10 to the negative two. And if we were to change these to the same scientific notation, 1.6 times 10 to the negative two is the same as 16 times 10 to the negative three. So we're actually going from four to 16, which is quadrupling the reaction rate. So here, our rate increases by a factor of four, so now we ask ourselves, two to what power gives us four? And that answer, of course, is two, meaning that our reaction is second order with respect to C. And our overall rate law, we can write it as the following. Rate equals K times A to the power of one times C squared. 
You can note here that I don't have to write in the one because if I don't write anything, it's assumed that the exponent is one. You can also see here that I excluded b, and that's because b has an exponent of zero. So whatever its value is, it's always to the power of zero, which always gives us a value of one. So this rate law is the answer using experimental data. All right, so that's one way of determining the rate law. Another way is using elementary steps. Elementary steps describe the individual steps that are actually occurring during the reaction. And you know it's an elementary step if they give you a reaction mechanism. So make sure you only use this if you're given a reaction mechanism. If you're given an overall reaction, it's not going to work. And often good indications that you're dealing with a reaction mechanism is if they tell you there's a step one and there's a step two, or if it's a clearly a one-step reaction. Now, when you're dealing with a multiple-step reaction, they'll often indicate which step is slower, which one is faster, which we can see here, this is the slower step, this is the faster step. So, of course, this being the slow step means that this is also the rate-determining step. But that's not what we're interested in here, right? Here we want to know what is the rate law. And here, it's possible for you to write a rate law for each step of the reaction. And the way it works with elementary steps is you write rate equals k, so that part doesn't change, you always have the rate constant. Then for step one, you're going to use the reactants. So we're going to have A, and we're going to have C, and the stoichiometric coefficients become exponents. So A is to the power of one, C is to the power of two. So here's the first important thing to know. Stoichiometric coefficients become exponents. Or they are the reaction orders. Okay, so that's the rate law for the first step. We can now look at the rate law for the second step. Another important thing to keep in mind is, even though we're basically just using the reactants and the stoichiometric coefficients as the reaction orders, we only use aqueous and gaseous substance in the rate law, which means we exclude solids and liquids. In this case, I is a solid, so we're not going to include it in the rate law for the second step. So that means for the second step, the rate law is simply gonna be K times a concentration of B, to the first power. And I'll note here, exclude solids and liquids. All right, so with elementary steps, it's pretty easy. You don't have to do quite as much work, but you do have to make sure you know what you're doing in order to get the correct rate law. All right, so again, here are two different ways to determine the rate law that you want to know for LAMCAT. 